¿De una vez, Oscar? Listo, sí, de una vez. Ok. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Ampil Ruelas. I am the academic coordinator at the Expansion Center here in Cusco. Today is a very special day. It's the anniversary of Cusco, and we are very happy and proud to celebrate it. I want to thank you for your attendance today. In addition to thanking two speakers and friends who will talk about education for sustainable development, we have uh, the honor of presenting Melissa Lee, who is the founder of the Green Program, who has been working us a long time with us. We also have Professor Oscar Ortega, who is charging this session to you. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go. Great, thank you, Abdi, and thank you, Yusuf, for having us and, and celebrating the anniversary of Cusco with the Green Program today to talk a little bit more about sustainable development um, in Peru. So I see a lot of Green Program students or potential students signing on too, so we're really excited to have you join us and everybody else learn more about this program that we have created in Peru. Um, again, my name is Melissa Lee. I'm gonna share my screen really quick. And um, I'm the founder and CEO of the Green Program. Um, I'll get into my story a little bit later, but I will definitely say that my story and journey with sustainability has, I think, always been with me since I was a child and growing up just always having an innate care for the environment, animals, you name it. Um, that's been something that's been really important to me, human rights, um, without knowing that it was even called human rights at a young age. So, you know, growing up and being able to explore ways of uh, how I could stay grounded with that interest in mind and seeking professions or um, professions that allowed me to align with my interesting to me was really important. Um, so I am now, you know, uh, running the green program full time for the past uh, 10 years. We're going to our 11th year now. And um, we'll tell you a little bit more about the story too of how we started as students um, at university. Um, but, you know, I love to explore the world. I travel as sustainably as possible. And I'm also a certified rescue diver. So the ocean is near and dear to my heart. Um, I think there's a lot more we should be learning about our oceans that we don't know about yet. Um, but that's a little bit about me and I'm excited to talk more with you all soon. Um, and this is also our professor, Oscar Ortega, that would like to introduce himself as well. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Well, I'm Oscar Ortega, I'm an agronomist. So I studied at the National University here in Cusco, uh, be teaching for more than 10 years already. And I'll kind of along with our presentation, I'll share my experience with sustainability and how it usually starts as one thing and then ends as a, a completely different. So it, this is more like a journey uh, so that's why we are going to share with you and like how uh, we, uh, so that's why we connected so, so, so fast with Melissa and the Green Program because we kind of like share the same belief that, uh, yeah, it, this is achievable. Right? So that's what we want to share today. Uh, but then we need to take like different approaches. So we need to be conscious about uh, other, other people's like thinking. So that's what we want to do uh, today. So we'll take it from there. All right, back to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Oscar. Um, okay, so just to tell you a little bit more about the Green Program, we're going to start off and share our missions just straight forward. It's pretty straightforward um, and why we do what we do. So our mission is to educate and empower future sustainability leaders through innovative models of experiential education, travel, and adventure. What do we do um, is basically design innovative programs uh, with 21st century sustainability workforce skills in mind. What those skills will look like are what these 10 skills you see on the bottom here. These are the top 10 skills needed for the fourth industrial revolution that we are in. Um, so this has changed a lot. If you look at 
2015, the top 10 skills needed, creativity was not on the top of that list. Um, change and adaption was not on that list. Diversity and cultural intelligence was not on that list. So things are changing and now more than ever we know um, that that can change in an instant, you know, in the world that we're living now. So our job with the Green Program is to design really meaningful and impactful programs that are short term um that deliver on these types of skills that you might not feel like you're getting in a classroom um our model just to give you a little bit more about that and why we're a little bit different than maybe some of your other traditional programs is that it's short term what we mean by short term is eight to ten day models and programs abroad and the reason why we do that is for accessibility um, it, our programs are all during winter spring and summer break for students all around the world and our students come from about 500 universities and 70 countries around the globe. Um, Peru is one of the uh, many locations that we've um, had our programs. You can see, hopefully, um, on the right side of the screen are some of the locations that we've had. Um, and all of our programs are focused on sustainable development. So our courses in Peru, for example, water resource management and sustainable practices. We study in Iceland, um, renewable energy innovation. We go to Fukushima, Japan to study uh, um, disaster mitigation and nuclear to renewable transitions as well. So those are a few examples of where we've been around the world. But our goal is to create, how do we use the world as our classroom in an intensive, be purposeful uh, about our timing um, and what we do on the ground there and really walk away with tangible skills to be effective people in a workforce that is very sustainably minded. I'll dive into my story a little bit. Um, I started the Green Program in 2009. Uh, I was a sophomore, I was 19 years old, I was studying at Rucker University, majoring in undecided at the time because I had no idea what I wanted to be doing. And again, I, I knew what I was passionate about. I knew what set me on fire and got me excited. Um, there were usually complex things like the environment, sustainability, human rights, and I didn't know what kind of direction that would be put, especially if you put it into a category of a major. So that was really difficult for me, um, and those are some of the challenges that I faced as a student. Um, but on top of that, what the study abroad industry looked like, um, what at the time, and there's more of these short-term programs now, not as uh, intensive as ours, but what these programs looked like at the time were that they were a year long or a semester long, and a student like me was not able to afford a program um, at that scale. So uh, I was privileged though to, to be a first generation born uh, American. My family is from uh, Malaysia. So so privileged to be able to travel and see the world and learn from all these different people and cultures and real life experiences that I never had in the classroom. I never really appreciated that until later on in college and in life when so many of my friends at the time were actually had, may have never left the state and this is New Jersey. So, you know, this was an opportunity where it was really important to me to say there has to be room where we can innovate within the space of higher education study abroad and where the future workforce needs to go. In my eyes, it was sustainable development. And it would take a lot more people than me. It would take a lot more people who are smarter than me. Um, so, you know, we knew that our green army basically had to be born, which is the green program and all of the hundreds of students or thousands of students that have joined us over the years. So we started in 2009 in Costa Rica. Um, it was over our summer breaks, winter breaks, spring breaks. We were spending there developing these programs. Um, I will also say, one the thing that we specialize in is uh, exclusive access so our programs are um, opening the doors and giving access to places that you can't just walk into as a tourist ask uh, professor Ortega will go through a few more of those as examples of what we do on the proof program specifically but we really want to bring industry to life and give professional practice during our programs in 2013, we launched our, piloted our Iceland program as well. And then in 2014, um, a professor from Cabrini College in Pennsylvania actually reached out and wanted to customize a course with us. Um, and it was interesting and he was just very set on Peru and set on the idea of water. But we said, uh, okay, we'll look into it. And we don't just say yes to every university who wants a custom program. So we looked into it and did some more research. And this is what we found. So this is an updated chart of what's happening in sustainable development around the world. This is honed in specifically with 
grew on the 20 uh, SDGs index. Um, for those of you who are not aware, the sustainable development goals are the 17 most pressing issues that the world faces today. Um, the UN has set out with 195 member states to accomplish or make a big difference by 2030. So we have about 10 years to start putting a bigger dent into this. Um, so we need more of your minds, more of your innovation and passion to be dedicated to these types of issues and challenges. So anyway, going back to the screen, um, we're looking right here at Peru. So the global index score of Peru is 71. And you can see on that score, just relatively, it's good, you know? Like Peru is making, since we know they're, they're, they are on the Paris Agreement, they have agreed to the Sustainable Development Goals, they're making steps, um, and their government is on board. So that's a great sign for us and a green program destination. Um, but of course, there's still more work to be done. So we always acknowledge that as well. Um, but you know, when we look a little bit closer at what's excelling in Peru, you can see down below in that second half, climate action is scoring nicely in Peru. They're doing something really well there. Poverty, no poverty and eradicating poverty um, is almost at a 90. I know that's one that the Peruvian government is really um, pushing on and really uh, like taking a critical eye on as well because their poverty rates are, are have increased, but they're working on that. Um, affordable and clean energy is another one which we also integrate into our programs and clean water and sanitation. So those are the strengths when we look at Peru from a global index for sustainable development. And this is more recent, of course, in 2019. So we did a similar study and just a, a look at what's happening in Peru before we even went to Peru. So it checks off the boxes in terms of what are case studies and where in the world are epicenters that we can really learn and gain access and also, um, sh you know, share knowledge, resources, and, and just be able to br bring everyone together to come up with this like future workforce for sustainability. So before I get into the next slide, some of you guys sneak peek, um, there's a chat bar on your, on your screen. And I have a quiz for everybody. So what would you say, which is the richest country in the world? That's the question. If you can throw your answers into the chat, we want to see who gets it right. And there's no Googling, no cheating. I'm seeing China, I'm seeing Norway, US. Finland or Norway. I'm not giving any more hints. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. Okay. So Japan, those are all great guesses. You guys are doing great. So actually, oops, actually the richest country in the world is Peru. Did you know that? <laughs> so in 2017, um, the Peruvian tourism board pushed out a campaign that called Peru the richest country in the world. And by that they meant experiences, by that they meant memories, um, things that people aren't able to do on their own for a whole new generation of travelers that might not have been the case earlier on. So when we, when we mean the richest country in the world, that I think was the perfect slogan that summed it up for me personally for how I feel about Peru as well in terms of the people, the culture, the history. Um, when we look at this list, there's cultural diversity. There's, you know, so many, when you look into just what's the deeper levels of the indigenous communities as well, it's just so much rich history and all of this gastronomy. Um, Peru has been rated the best culinary destination multiple years in a row. So that, you know, there's so many things I can go on and on about Peru, the natural wonders um, and the biodiversity there. And also of course the world wonders, like you all know Machu, Machu Picchu and hopefully a lot of you will be able to experience that one day as well. Um, and another thing that's important to us for leadership development and just getting yourself out of your comfort zone, seeing the country and really just doing things that you're not able to do sitting in a classroom is exploration and adventure. So there's so much of this that really Peru for us with um, case study, but also a really rich experience that we could provide to so many students around the world who are craving these. So long, long, long story longer, um, you know, we said, that's it. We love Peru. We think this could be really great. Let's go. So we went, I did a lot of research in a lot of different universities and institutions who could be a great partner for us. Hands down, when I met the UCL team and I met Professor Ortega, it was very clear that, you know, especially with 
Professor Zortega's um, like-mindedness, his passion for sustainability, and also just um, his life experience as well was a great fit. And just he's been such a role model to so many of our students on the program as well. Um, so he'll tell you a little bit more about the course and what we do specifically in showcasing Peru as one of the epicenters for sustainable development. And Oscar, I'll just, um, yeah. Yeah, I'll share now, so. Okay, I'll stop my share. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you, Melissa. All right, so then, uh, yes, it's uh, going along to what uh, Melissa has presented on. Yeah, Peru is uh, the richest country in the world. But sometimes, well, I saw some of the uh, questions on the chat room. Well, obviously, when it comes to decide, like, what's the richest country in the world, we was like by GDP. So is probably or nature to uh, to monetize uh, certain things that we will see later towards the conference how some of them are invaluable. So when it comes to the, the program itself, uh, it takes me back like the first time that we met with uh, Melissa and other representatives, like how, how we can put a, a, together a course that will show exactly that like how sustainable development is not necessarily about the environment. It's not necessarily about the people. It's not necessarily about the money. It's actually about those three things combined. So Peru, uh, the, this little exercise that we have uh, with the students well, as soon as they arrive, we ask them, like, what do you know about Peru? And a lot of them obviously mentioned Machu Picchu. They, they mentioned uh, history. Uh, sometimes they mention things that unfortunately are negative that we are known for some issues with our politics things like that so so then uh, some of them mentioned el nino climate change all all of them valid points but at the same time that peru has seems to have a lot of problems we have a lot of resources as well so the very first uh, lecture that we uh, we give uh, in this course is exactly about that like how Peru is extremely diverse and that creates different conditions. So then that also diversifies and, or, uh, or economic uh, activities. Also the way that our people behave, the concept, uh, uh, the, the value that we allocate to a specific resources. So uh, some, some students mentioned that, well, I heard that there's water scarcity in Peru. Well, that's true, that's true, but not everywhere. So, so then our geography becomes a big, big challenge in here. So we go over things like obviously geography, just to understand like how like Peru, like the old population is, is not evenly distributed. So then like what activities uh, or uh, indigenous people perform, like where they are located. Okay, also we go over like how Peru is very unique in the world in terms of like even the location. Like it's located on the area where we are supposed to receive, but we receive most of the solar radiation here in the tropics. We also have the the, uh, the tropical glaciers that are melting down at a faster rate. We are also a country that is uh, is affected by two different ocean currents. All that that really captures the uh, this idea of how the environment is so critical for our livelihood. But in many cases, we just take it for granted. Right? But at the same time that we are so diverse in terms of like some of the problems that we go through, we are one of the 17 mega diverse countries or numbers are huge in terms of like potato variety. So uh, the, the students are all excited about like hearing about that, that well, it's uh, in this class and uh, that's what we try to push really hard on the green program is the fact that we don't deny the problems. And, uh, is a, the, I'm a, a firm believer that if you don't understand the problem, it's impossible to find a solution. And you have to be there. But then you, you also have to be conscious that there's plenty of resources that we can use, that we can share. So then we can have like projects that will, I don't know, like take a potato variety from here to, to, to somewhere in Africa. And then we'll try to find a way to use the same resource. So like sharing is being important and then Peru being Again, like the richest country in the world. I and mean, so there's a big, big chance for us uh, to help others. Right? So 
the Peruvian diversity is the core lecture in this course to get everyone to know the country, but then also at the same time, here we go over like the, the different economic activities that we have. Like I asked them to guess kind of like what Melissa did. Like the first country is like, what do you think is the main economic activity in Peru? And everyone said, well, agriculture, right? Fortunately, it's not like that. So then I don't want to spoil the content of my classes that much. I hope like some of the people in the audience will get to join us. But well, unfortunately, it's not agriculture, which is sad because we come from huge history, like not just the Incas, spray Incas, that, that was the main economic activity. And now we have the two most unsustainable practices out there that sustain our economy. So this is the core lecture. So as soon as they get to know the country, immediately after that, we move into the, the course itself. So the course, uh, well, this presentation, uh, it's more like a disclaimer. So it's, it's not necessarily uh, about the content of the class. It's like our perception as part of the green program in like how sustainable development is not is not supposed to be taught. That's not and that's not the intention. It's more like how we teach about sustainability in this in this course and like how how we try to complement different factors. So we value uh, the the theory, of course, I have been a student myself and I have read like many papers uh, where that's where the information come from. But on the green program, we want to provide the experience as well. So then when our class is about water resources and sustainability, we try to complement each lecture with an attached field trip. So then the theory is there, but then we, we need we want our students to feel what it is. Right? So on the lecture about water resources in Peru, we go over so just some, some just mind-blowing statistics. Peru's got like 4% of the total fresh water of the planet. That's a lot, but then why, why we have uh, also people uh, like going through terrible times, like getting water like one or two times uh, a month in this, isolated places in the middle of the desert. So it's because like water is not necessarily distributed uh, for everyone. So uh, there's this, this graph down here that shows like how or like highest like population density is in places like Lima where we had 10 million out of the 33 million Peruvians. And then we have most of our water is located actually like from the highlands to the jungle. But why don't you take water from this place to this place? Well, the mountains are in the middle. Right? So then we need technology for that. So now this is the point where the, the beauty about the green program is that we don't get, uh, we get students from different backgrounds. Uh, so then obviously uh, uh, as uh, and a sociology major and anthropologist or a biologist, they'll be more concerned about, nothing wrong with that, but like, uh, about the people and like how we, we need to do this. It doesn't matter like how much money we invest on it. Maybe the engineers will be the ones that will say like, well, great, we can, uh, we can uh, implement an inverted siphon in there. So we'll invest millions of dollars in doing that. That'll cost money. So then it's, it's great to see like right from this unit and on how everyone will provide their own ideas and then we'll try to find a solution, right? So, here we also uh, go back in time a little bit in terms of like how uh, we have uh, so much technology that comes from our ancestors. But I always make clear that I am not taking, trying to take anything away from the Incas. They were one of the uh, most important civilizations in the world. By the way, they learn a lot from pre-Inca cultures. So well, I take them through what the Mochicas created in the north, what, uh, what the Nazcas created in the middle of the, uh, of the desert. And they actually came up with high engineering in here. These holes in here, they are known as pukios. So they use this basic physics to pull water from the underground and use it for agriculture. Right? Then we have this, this kind of floating uh, fields uh, next to the Titicaca Lake that comes from the Tiahuanaco. And then where well, the Incas just took all those ideas, they put it together, they made it perfect. And well, they, they created things like Morai and the old terracing systems that we have. So, so this is not meant to be an, uh, uh, kind of like an architecture and a history class. It's more about like how we, we use water before and how we value it as well. Water was sacred. 
So it, water was uh, water was something that came from Salcamama, which is the provider, and then he fed water to the Pachamama. So then there's there's all this. Uh, it's not trying to romanticize it, but like how valuable it is. So I here I touch upon a little bit on like what, how indigenous people they created this, but they they didn't create anything without asking for permission. So this ritualistic aspect, the importance of water, and all the way to what we do right now. Okay? So. That's the theory. And then the very next day, if not the same day, we have our field trip. So we visit these archaeological sites called Tipon. Uh, another great thing about the green program is that, of course, I am the professor, but I'm not the expert when it comes to history, when it comes to to all this valuable information as well. So we have a, we have a guide that will cover these aspects. So then uh, once we are done with, uh, with the tour, because we we need to understand also that a lot of our students, this is the first time that they are visiting uh, Peru. So they are all excited to, to visit archeological sites. Uh, I, I always like to have my students motivated. So then the more we move out from the classroom, the better. So what we do is we turn Tipon into our classroom and give another lecture in there. But this lecture is more about watersheds, about hydrology, hydraulics, so what we do is we we try to go backwards in here. The canal in there, the Inca Canal, is already built. So what we do is we run a survey and then we, we measure all the dimensions of the canal and then we go back to the lab and we use a 3D software, in this case it's the XRAS. Uh, so, so then we recreate the canal. Obviously the Incas didn't know about the Manning equation. They didn't have these fancy instruments and mathematical equations that we have right now. But then we, we see that these canals are perfect. They never spill. They, they carry the water that they are supposed to. Now, with, uh, and uh, we always have civil engineers and I ask them like, what would you need to build this? And they, they come up with a plan that sometimes it takes like days, if not, if not months. They need to calculate the amount of water that, that farmers will need, etc. So this complements nicely the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the lecture that was uh, provided the day before. Then we move to environmental issues. So as we have uh, a lot of water, as we, uh, as we praise it and well, it's something sacred, at the same time, we have a lot of issues. So here is where uh, we present not just on environmental issues that are related to water, but more like to, to understand the mindset. This is where we talked about policy and politics a little bit. So, uh, and that's the, that's the important part. Uh, we, we don't cherry pick in terms of like, this is nice and this is going to be, uh, this, is go this is what, or the students are going to like. There is nothing wrong uh, uh, about talking uh, about these kind of negative aspects. So we have massive deforestation in Peru. Right? We we lost uh, like close to like 1,500 acres uh, like per day. That's what's going on right now. We have people working on illegal mining, as you can see in the picture in here, where uh, a lot of uh, farmers that cannot perform agriculture on the lands anymore, they move into these areas and they then they don't subject just themselves but also their kids to this poisonous uh, uh, metals like uh, like mercury. So then like how illegal mining is creating a huge, huge problem. We have a rampant air pollution as well. We have, uh, we generate like between one to three kilograms uh, of uh, waste per person. Okay. So, so how at the same time that uh, we we say that we have uh, 117 uh, different uh, life zones in Peru that makes us the, the most diverse country in terms of the environment, or we have 4,000 potato varieties. At the same time, we have these things going on, right? So what's happened is like so a lot of uh, cases, we either don't have the policy or we have the policy and but it's not properly implemented. Uh, we discussed like how Peru is extremely young when it comes to environmental policy. And we always compare how old is the EPA in the US compared to how old is the Ministry of the Environment here in Peru and how we are learning. Uh, but we're learning while we are, uh, we are harming our environment, which is not a good thing. Okay? So attached to this uh, lecture, we have our uh, visit to the uh, Watanay River. 
So here is where uh, the way that we present this field trip is uh, we have this issue. Okay, so most of the time we use the mal the clonic malnutrition in Peru. Okay, so we visit this area here in Cusco, that which is not that far away from the school. Okay, uh, is uh, one of the most polluted rivers in the uh, in the country. Okay? So. Uh, and how this has kind of different reasons, like why it's happening. And this is also where we have another clash between our humanities and our science students. So, so I'll ask them, uh, if we have 60% malnutrition in our kids right now, chronic malnutrition, how would you fix it in this environment here? So the engineers will say, well, we have to fix the river. We have to probably install a filter or something. So we'll need to find a way. We'll need to create technology to fix this, so the uh, so the kids will get better. But then uh, humanities study uh, students will say like, but what about the kids? Let's help them first. Let's create a social program first, and let maybe let's educate people first. So this is this is where I started kind of introducing this idea that. Uh, there's not a single solution and we need to get used to that if if we if we don't like the people that are polluting this instead of complaining and telling them that they should stop doing it we should talk with them say like why are you doing this so then we can find a solution so here is where we discuss this idea of the different pillars so the uh, the river obviously is part of the environmental pillar but in the social pillars, the people that's out there that is suffering, but also at the same time are contaminating the river. And the economic pillar is probably the money that we will need to fix something like this. Right? So, so uh, the, uh, the interesting thing about this is like, well, I have a picture down in here that is not related to the green program. This is me teaching my Kuskenian students and a big percentage of them, sometimes they're shocked. They live here in Cusco and they say, like, there's the first time that I come here. I knew about the Watanai River, how bad it was, but I, I didn't know that, like, this person or these people created this problem and why. So, attached to this, we visit the, tre the water treatment facility where we look at, like, what the government is doing. Right? So, they are treating the waste. But then we go over some of the social aspects, some political aspects in here, how the river is not treated itself, is more about the waste, et cetera. So this complements this previous presentation where the environmental issues are not there, are, are there, but like here is where we try to understand the why. Okay. Now, then we get to, well, obviously climate change is considered also an environmental issue, but like climate change is discussed separately in here. Uh, please, I'll ask uh, all of you to bear with me here. This is something that I teach in a full semester in one school, well, in two hours for the green program. And now I'm, I'm mushing uh, one slide for all of you in five minutes. So the way that we teach about climate change in here, is obviously we go over the concepts, but uh, we have uh, we start this uh, presentation with uh, uh, with an exercise. I ask my students to calculate their footprint, and uh, that breaks a lot of hearts. Okay? So then we get to discuss about like why this is really happening. Right? So we go over Peru and like how Peru goes from being the third most uh, vulnerable country in the world to climate change to ten and back. So every time that El Nino happens, is devastating for us. We are the country that gets gets shattered in terms of not not just our people, obviously, but then uh, our economy gets set set back like five years, ten years in comparison to the rest. So this is a personal opinion, but probably uh, Peru is a developing country because of El Nino, and then El Nino is becoming more dramatic, is becoming more consistent. This is where we talk about the difference between magnitude and intensity, like how as a, as a planet we have increased our temperature, but that didn't happen. So back in 2007, we call it global warming because we didn't understand fully what was going on. But as, as soon as uh, the 2008, 2010, uh, we call it climate change right now because th there are some places that are actually getting colder. So, but then we also like to look at the other side. There is uh, other scientists out there 
that actually claim that this is not necessarily caused by humans. This is more like a, a just a natural phenomena. So there's a graph in here in the middle that's called the Milankovitch cycles. That's supposed to uh, we are supposed to go through an uh, an ice age every hundred thousand years. So then in that process, obviously your temperature goes up and down. So this might be natural. Right? Now my job as a professor is to present both sides of the story. I cannot be biased, and even even more so when it comes to uh, climate change and sustainability but well the consequences are there so my students well, I, I refer them back to this slide in here or this picture this is actually the railroad that takes us to Machu Picchu so like yeah that's how it was when El Nino happened so uh, that's climate change how we complement this we go to the Waipo Lake so nothing uh, well we Try to bring the positive aspect of this as well. Waipo Lake, for the ones that don't know it, well, it's it's here in Cusco, and this is one of the most successful systems, at least when it was implemented. So then this uh, this lake was drying out. So uh, in uh, like where we are standing, that used to be like uh, easily 100, 150 meters, like inside the lake, it was completely dry. But then when the Sandor project was implemented, it was able to recover the lake, right? So, so then sometimes we have, uh, we, are, uh, we have a guide from the government as well. So this is kind of like how we explain uh, how the social and the environmental aspect and also the, the engineers can meet. So this was, this was a high, high engineering. This was an inverted siphon that allowed them to take water from one mountain to the other and also use the lake as a natural reservoir. So, so the impact is there, obviously there's more water, but how now the, the ecosystem as a whole has improved in response to that, how there were plenty of, uh, of maestros, of healers that used to perform rituals that they couldn't anymore on this area. And also, and now that the, the, uh, the lakes recover, they can do so. So then there's like multiple effects now before the project, the, uh, just because the, the water has this kind of like heating capacity, they used to cultivate just potatoes, but now they can cultivate corn, etc. So, so how we can turn uh, something like this, like into something like this. So there's more like 5,000 families that get the benefit out of, a pro out of this project. This uh, gentleman here, he used to tell us a story that all the white hair that he's got is, is because of this project. It's like how the project was, was approved, I think it was in 2003, something like that. And it took them three years to convince people that this was actually possible. The money was there, right? the need was there, but the people were in between. So then now the social is, is not allowing us to make something like this happen because some people don't understand like how something like this could be established. Right? And then we move into renewable energy. So how we use water as a resource. Uh, well, so far up to here, it's more like about agriculture livelihood, but here's more about harnessing energy. So we visit the Machu Picchu hydropower. Okay? So but we visit both places, we visit the gate, and we also visit the generators. So here uh, we uh, they understand like how, on top of water being sacred, of top on top of water being like eighty percent of it being used like mainly for agriculture, we uh, we also use it for hydropower. Sixty five percent of our electricity comes from hydropower. So uh, that's great news, but also that makes us extremely extremely dependent. So and also being the third country most vulnerable to climate change. So it is. If we have this as a, every time that we hear about a country with a, a high percentage of electricity coming from renewable energy, we're happy about it. But then in terms of water, that extremely, that, that's something that we need to consider. Right? So we visit these areas. Uh, we, have, uh, we have experts from the, uh, from the hydropower that gives us the tour. So, and like how important this is for the Kuskenian and also the Peruvian community because this is connected to the grid. Right? Now, well, during this this visit, obviously the students visit Machu Picchu. That's that's the that the tourist side of the program. And then finally, we get to this. So uh, when we discuss sustainable development, and this is where I kind of like share my own experience as well, like how uh, I I well I I actually studied uh, agronomy. Well, because my my father, my mentor turned out to be my professor at the university as well. He used to take me to his uh, field trips when I was five. So, well, I was born into it, 
right? And then, well, maybe like privately, I was hoping to create this awesome potato variety that will fix every single problem. We know it's not that simple as that. So that's kind of like my journey towards uh, sustainable development as well. Like when uh, I when I finished my uh, my profession here in Peru, I went to UC Davis to California and I was working on population genetics for a while. And when I came back, I, I was required to use some of that data uh, in the indigenous communities. So I have all my data in terms of like increasing yield, all that. But then you walk into a community that actually the most pressing issue is that they don't have water. So you might have all the variety, marvelous variety, but then you don't have water to irrigate. And then we also learned that the teacher at their school shows up like twice a week and then that you have malnutrition. So all of the sudden uh, you have one piece of the puzzle. So, so then that's what sustainable development is. So here we go over the, uh, so that's how I ended up teaching this class. So uh, here the idea of sustainable development is uh, it kind of like goes against the, the idea of just development that is kind of like turning this backwards uh, community that uses a lot of people, it spends a lot of time in doing something that we can easily do with uh, just some tractors and like have it more industrialized. Okay? Take the backward countries up to speed with the industrialized world. That's the concept of development that was established back in the 60s. But then we talked about like how we have the pillars in between the environment, society and the economy, how we always have this trade-off. Seems like most of the countries that move uh, like towards a good economy, they sacrifice the environment on the way, I, they, they sacrifice the society on the way as well. So uh, we talked about the scale being extremely important and how at the individual level, I'm not saying that's easy, but like at the individual level, it's just up to us. We decide to become vegetarians. We decide to carpool instead of like using public transportation, something like that. But then this is scaling it up, that's the thing. So I always ask my students like, Oria, are you vegetarian? Great. Have you tried to convince anyone in your household to become a vegetarian? Some say yes, some say no. And then the community city. So then we go from the bottom and top. And like how to, where, where on these levels we can, we can establish something that will be uh, possible to enforce through, through policy, but also like feasible enough. So we, you can have an you know, action happening. And then, well, we obviously talk about the 17 goals. We can we kind of compare it to the eight millennium goals that we had back then as well. How sustainable development is supposed to be a concept, and it's extremely subjective. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't have principles to follow. So, so it's like, uh, yeah, let's be nice with each other. Okay, great. So that's the concept. But how we do it? So then, uh, so we spend a good like three, four hours talking about this as well. So, so then the, all, this is the content, okay? but then again, this presentation is about like how we teach it. So uh, we always uh, like so to, for all the students to experience all this. So once we are done with classes, we move into uh, the practical part. Okay? So then this is the hands-on. So we have service learning, so um, USIL, it's like partnerships with schools, like Wilcapata School, uh, for example, we have also the Ocopata School and the Ocopata community, where we install um, uh, an irrigation system there. We also team up with uh, a couple of the schools in the city, Santa Maria, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, where we, we just build a small like greenhouse for them. So, uh, but we do this after. So, so the students now they have the knowledge they have uh, like what it's going on here they have now they have the not just the why but also the how okay? because the what is there so then that is what they need to reflect like once we are done with uh, these uh, these activities this is where they kind of like graduate from the program so this is the capstone project so these are some of these requirements and this is where uh, I restate the importance of the economy when it comes to sustainable development. So first, the students start like kind of picking up a project that would like to fix. So what is something that you will want to work on? So in this case, for example, you say like, yeah, I, I want to improve the efficiency when it comes to irrigation. Great, that's the what. 
like how you are planning to do it. So this is where technology probably will come in or, or maybe a, a social program or something like that. But then the important thing is like why you want to do it. So like who you want to benefit out of this. So this is a very good analysis. And this is probably the portion that sometimes is missing in projects and like how we focus so much on the what and then we don't even understand like why we're doing it. And then the, it comes the business canvas. Unless you, uh, unless you have access to millions of dollars that will pay for your project, great. But you have to make your project sustainable. So you need to find partnerships. So you need to, you need to see like how valuable this is. You need to sell this because you need to make your project sustainable. Uh, it's always important to understand that well, these, a lot of these uh, the students that join this program, they are very passionate about what they do. But uh, we always remind them that, okay, you will establish a project. It will last for six months, but when you leave, what's going to happen? Maybe the person that will follow you, they, they are not as passionate as you are. They might not be willing to donate money or time as you are doing. So then we need to think about that as well. So then if your project generates some money to sustain itself, that's what sustainability is. Then we, uh, we require them to select the scale where they are planning to work. We all, always aim to the city because that's where we can have policy that will support our project. And then we also talk about like what sustainable goals, uh, sustainable development goals we will, uh, will attach. And they give very nice presentation. So in a selfish way, this is my most, my favorite part of the program because I can see like these students talking fluently and not just about like what they learn in class. Of course, a lot of them, they know a big deal about that, but like kind of like trying to connect the dots. So I all, we always encourage them to just, you, I probably, you know, people in here because they share your same background. Don't work with them, work with someone else that will challenge you. Always remind them that it's boring when you talk with someone that thinks the same way that you do. You're not going to learn anything. So, so yeah, the caps and projects are always, always great. All right. So then, well, that's the content of the class. All right, Melissa, back to you. Woo, Oscar, you, yeah, that just to give everyone an idea um, of the type of learning materials, and that's just such a small part of what we do. Um, but Oscar, if you want to go to the next slide, yes, please. I'm yeah, happy sure. to summarize right. that. Thank you. I'm happy to summarize that. So what this course looks like in the context of the green program, we're going to wrap it all up. So this course that we've put together with all this learning material, all these sites, um, all the experiences involved too. We didn't even talk about any of the adventure activities we do, the food that we eat, the sites that we see, the Machu Picchu tours, the train rides, everything like that. Um, this is all wrapped into a 10-day Peru Water Resource Management and Sustainable Practices program through the Green Program. Um, our model stands true across all of our programs, so this is short-term and intensive. 10 days, our spring programs um, over spring break are nine days. Uh, it's 50 plus hours with it and two credits from UCIL. Our programs are all, again, SDG focused and career focused too. So we're making sure you're practicing all those skill sets that I mentioned earlier in that in this presentation. Hopefully you can see where we're practicing that throughout these, whether it's going to a, field, a site visit um, or practicing and, and pitching your capstone project. Um, so we want you to make sure you're gaining and practicing real world skills. Increase accessibility. Within the model, again, um, our programs are nearly 90% less cost and and time than a traditional uh, semester or year abroad. So because it fits within that winter, spring, or summer break model, it allows so many more diverse students to attend our programs and get access to our programs, even those who are just engineers. And you just can't take a whole year off without graduating on time or staying on track. So that's, that's what we're here for. But speaking of engineers, we are also interdisciplinary. And I think that's something that more programs, we would love to see more programs do because of the, in innate benefit that comes out from this you know we it's a natural learning process once you bring in humanities with engineers with business students with art students you know we've had any everything from aerospace engineers to um, art history and anthropology majors and they all come together for these capstone projects and, and develop real world solutions um, and we know that we have long-term impact so our programs are short-term but what's important to us is long-term impact so what happens when students come home 
is that they all join our alumni network where there's over 3,000 students from over 70 countries around the world who are also passionate, just like you all are, about making a difference and making sure that we continue on this path. So what Green Program does for our students as well is we're making sure you're getting access to jobs, you're connecting with each other, you know, we want to make sure that you're invited to regroup on more programs or alumni reunions with us and really uh, carrying this community through because Green Program alumni are the ones who are going to change the world. They already are the ones changing the world for the better. So our job is to support that and make sure that we can continue that for everybody moving forward. And how do we know it works? Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our students say so. Um, these are just some fun like uh, reviews and, and uh, snippets from students who have left us reviews and if anyone can look them up online or check us out on uh, Study Abroad 101. We have a lot of reviews as well, um, but we can go to the next slide as well. More importantly, we actually just had a recent study done. I see, I think I saw Leonie here and she might still be here, but um, Uppsala University just ran a study um, with green program students and studying impact long term and short term. We're really pleased to see that 95% of students experience a sustainability related shift with an increase in awareness and consciousness of personal impacts, personal exchange and expertise in sustainability issues. So for us, you know, we know this model works. We're doing everything in 10 days and we know that there is a long-term impact that's making students move up the ladder in terms of that sustainability complex of how much impact they're actually making. Next slide, please. And when we look at the bigger picture, one of the things that I talked about earlier on, it's creating that green army. Who is this future workforce um, that's going to get out into the world, take their passions and be able to know how to apply it. I think that's where we're missing a lot of in education today. And the green program with UCIL and our, our program programs abroad have been able to bridge that gap for so many students. Um, so those are a few great places where our alumni are working now, NASA, Environmental Defense Fund, um, Sustainability Manager, Global Sustainability Manager at Nike, uh, NREL, you name it, our alumni are there all around the world making change. Um, and that's another snippet from the study that was done as well from Uppsala University, just summarizing and proving that Green Program alumni and students like you all who attend these types of programs, who get out there, get experience on their resume and in their tool belt are actually taking the next step forward to actually make that change and do it investing in themselves and their education to make sure that they're responsible uh, citizens for the world moving forward as well. Great and the last slide is just if anyone has questions thank you all for chiming in and listening to our talk today and learning more about the PRU program. We do have programs actually we are enrolling for our 2021 programs and we'll be releasing um, the spring and summer programs shortly as well. So you can feel free to contact us and connect with us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. So let's see. Okay, so. All right, so if we have some questions from the audience, please put them on the chat, chat room. Do you want to add something more, Melissa, maybe while we have people typing there? Oh, we just got a question. Save me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. You guys, so are these yeah. programs only for students? Yeah, so no, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So our green program requirement is 18 and older. Um, usually we do have majority university students and graduate students attend the programs, um, but young professionals, absolutely, individuals, absolutely. As long as you're 18 and older, um, passionate for sustainability, please get in touch with us. Uh, we do have an application, which is free to apply for, um, and that's how you can get involved with us first step. So just submit the application and our team will get back to you within 48 hours. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Rosario. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. So, oh. oh, that's for you as well. Yes. I. Oh, thank you, Jess. That is the link to the application. Um. So feel free to get involved there, and our website and more information about the Peru program 
course catalog, syllabus, all that good stuff is all within there too. Um, and you'll always get connected with a representative and someone who, who is your student success coordinator who can help you um, make sure you're benefiting getting the most out of the program. Mm -hmm. All right. Eh, Rosario B, ¿quiere participar? Por favor, denle micro. Eh. Ahí le doy micro. Ya está. Eh. Hola, ¿me escuchan? Sí, Rosario, sí. ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Hi. Hi. Um, uh, I am here in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm, uh, I'm on all about the program. Very, very, very interesting. Um, I will definitely uh, um, um, pass it around to people that I know, um, um, that are basically parents of, a, uh, of a students uh, that are university students. So um, I think it will be, but I would like to uh, see, like I said, if, if there is a, uh, if there's something that we can do for um, maybe knowing it in 10 days, but maybe a little bit longer for, uh, uh, for, for adults, for, for more parents um, on this. Um, that, that's just a question. Yeah, uh, Rosario, that's a great question. And I really appreciate your interest in, you know, having an uh, adult generation come on these programs. Um, I, we don't necessarily have one for parents if we're looking at it like in demographic, but we definitely will be releasing some soon, I think, for professionals as well, or like corporate um, as well. And that's just, you know, another age bracket that we can um, open this type of access to because we do agree that it's important that everybody can learn and get this type of experience. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Right, maybe something that I mentioned is like, yeah, sometimes like the eight to 10 days feels like a very, very short program, but uh, our students are, yeah, are stuck with us. So then they always have a mentor uh, that's with them like 24 seven. Well, even though they have like mm -hmm. classes, uh, like well, the lectures, then we have the field trips, there's a constant monitoring in there. So there's, there's the 10 days are like full on. Uh, yeah, we start what, maybe at eight, we finish kind of like at six, 7 p.m., something like that. So like multiple activities. So yeah, so yeah, it's it, it's not like it could get longer than ten days, but our experience is that yeah, even like nine days, ten days program, yeah, we get to accomplish uh, pretty much everything right. that we want for that group. Yeah, right, and it's it's designed in that way where we can do that. It's I'm not gonna lie, it's early mornings and late nights. <laughs> it's really intensive in that way. But um, if anyone can do it, it's it's uh, university students who have the energy to, yeah. to hustle through it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking forward to that and more of the programs too. Um, but yeah, I saw a question about longer than 10 days. Uh, yeah. 10 days is our max right now. And again, that is because of university holidays. So spring break will be nine day. That's usually the longest we can stretch it and multiple times throughout the year. And then 10 days is throughout the summer because we also acknowledge that students have internships, jobs, summer courses. You can't take the whole three months. A lot of times, at least the students that are attracted to the green program, um, they're usually doing a lot of other things outside of this travel opportunities. So we wanna make sure that uh, you can do it all with us. And that's, the, that's why we have 10 days. I have another question, Melissa, for you. Sure. Uh, is there, uh, do you um, work, is, is your organization, the Green Program, um, is it a non-for-profit organization? We, that's a good question. We're a public benefit corporation. Uh, okay. So what that means is there's a new wave, if you will, of B Corps, benefit corps. So they're social enterprises like the Patagonias of the world, the Ben and Jerry's of the world, mm -hmm. um, where the business model, there's, and I teach this to a lot of our students in the capstone projects too, but now it's not as black and white as a nonprofit and a for-profit. There's a whole generation of, of socially responsible businesses that exist for good. So Traditional corporations will look at your bottom line, which is corporate, uh, sorry, uh -huh. profit. And in our bylaws for any benefit corporation, we have to exist for triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. 
So that's how we are creating, and Oscar mentioned this before, that's our sustainability model. Um, and that's how we've continued to exist. We um, are a completely bootstrapped company and small business. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just how we've been able to do that. And how many uh, people are in this? Uh, I mean, you are the CEO. How, how big is this organization? We're a small team. We're based out in Philadelphia. Um, and But we have a global, you know, like our extension of our team with Oscar and everybody at UCIL. Is yeah. But I'm happy to talk to you more about it. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, and okay. I'm happy to share more information. Thank you for your questions. All right. So there's one more question there uh, from Leonie. Uh, well, uh, yeah. I was a while the green program uh, contacted us in New Zealand. I was already a university professor with them. So uh, yeah, I remember that meeting, like Melissa, she observed my class and then that's how we kind of like put it together. So uh, the university is the, the support that they provide uh, is, uh, is, is so important because like in terms of like logistics, in terms of also the, uh, the connections that UCL has not with uh, the with government in terms of like allowing us to visit the different facilities, uh, the treatment facility, the hydropower facility, it, yeah, it's 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 invaluable. So uh, yes, uh, because of uh, the ac academic support as well that students receive from the university, so it's it's a nice nice partnership. Uh, between well, the, the green program and also the university in terms of credits, in terms of like, support to the uh, to the students, but uh, as soon as well the students graduate, it's not like as Melissa says, it's not that they are abandoned out there. They have support from both sides. They become part of the uh, the green network, but then in terms of like, Usil as well, some of them they they choose to come back and take other classes with us. So it, it, it just opens them uh, into a completely different world, not just academic, but also in terms of the like green, in terms of like community. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a very good uh, teamwork that we have going on there. Yeah. Okay. All right, we good? Thank you right, everyone so, for joining us. Thank today. you so much uh, to everyone. I hope this was informative so if you have the chance well join us right, melissa that's all thank you um you still for hosting this and happy anniversary as well and i hope there's more celebrations to come in person next year hopefully too um but yeah as i i hope this was informative and gives some great insight into not only the program and what we do but you know Peru in the context of sustainable development. Um, so I hope you have the next steps and you feel equipped to, to take the next steps forward and get involved as well. But thank you, Yusuf, for having us in the Green Program too. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Oscar. We hope that you like this conference. We thank you for your attendance. Remember that tomorrow we have another session and we will talk about uh, right for Florinda Mato, the Turner with two specialists in Latin American literature at 5 p.m. Peruvian time. Okay. All right. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.